It's a dream come true and you've made it as a professional footballer. But what do you do when it's all over? Since you were 15 year old, I was 37 when I finished playing. Then I had, what, three and a half, four years at Barnsley and then boom, finished. Football had finished. And nobody, once you get the sack, Nobody really wants to know, the phone doesn't ring as much and things like that. So you have to come to terms with that. And it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, no, it can, be, it can be very difficult for some people. I, I think it's, it's difficult for, for a lot of players to come to terms with, um, with, with not, not playing. It's a fantastic way to, to earn a living being a, being a professional footballer and, and anybody who has that opportunity is very fortunate. Um, but you know at some point it's going to come to an end. and. Um, you know there are there are not many players who who can earn enough in the game to uh, to not have to work again. So the vast vast majority of players have to go on and do something else. So the the, the PFA are good in, in you know providing the opportunities and some funding for uh, for players to to gain further qualifications. But there are you know a, a good number of players who, who you know don't make those those kind of provisions and and have to make make late decisions. Um, and then even if you are prepared and you have your qualifications, it can still be very difficult sometimes to, to, to find um, a, a second career, if you like. Um, so I think it's right that there's a good number of players that do struggle with that, with that transition. Not everybody can stay in the game, although obviously a lot do. Some days were good, some days were bad. Uh, some days are more upsetting than others. Uh, obviously you wake up in the morning, you're not going training. You wake up in the morning, you're not going to see the lads. You wake up in the morning, you've not got a ball at your feet. Um, you wake up, you're basically sitting there, everyone else is at work, and it's a very lonely existence for a while. Um, so there's a bit of depression that sits, sets in there, and you kind of wonder to yourself where, you know, what you're going to do now, because it's, it's a big shock to the system. You know, losing something that you've had all your life, uh, and then having to deal with not having it all of a sudden. Uh, and looking to, to see where the next chapter of your life is going to go and, and what you're going to make of it. So, um, you know, there's difficult times and I can understand why a lot of football players have these struggles when they finish playing. But, um, you know, preparing for that moment when it does come to an end, you know, it, it's easier saying it than actually when it happens, the, the emotions that you get and the feelings that you have of loss, of maybe a bit like losing a loved one, I'd guess. Um, something so important to you, but it's part of life and you've got to move on. We're here today to meet a real Leeds legend from the 70s. And when you do an interview with a player like this, you've always got to take precautions. We go to the League Cup final in 68. And behind the Leeds goal was this banner, Norman by Chilegs. And ITV took it on and, and it showed it. But then what they did then, the next following uh, League Cup final, they ran a competition to see if anybody could get a better banner. So two years on the trot, this nickname of mine was stuck on a television. And I met the guys that, uh, that had done it and they were from this leisure centre in Oxford. But uh, it just stuck with me. It was just there, and wherever I go, people just say, if they say Norman Hunter, oh, bite your legs. So it's just stuck with me. I don't envy the players now. I think good luck to you. I wish I'd have been around money-wise to get the sort of money they're getting now. I wouldn't swap anybody's lifestyle for what I had. People I played with, the club I played for, and everything else, I was fortunate, I went with England, got a couple of World Cups, I've got a medal somewhere. Uh, so I wouldn't swap my life, but I think a lot of players of our era could have done, for what they, for what they put into the game, they could have done with the, being a bit more financially sound. Well, I'm not sure the way the game is now, whether I would have been quick enough to play in the central position because it's very, you're very exposed and you get an awful lot of one-on-ones and things like that. I could have done that role, as they say now, which the hold and midfield player. I could have sat in front of the back four, just won it, and give it to other people. 
I could have done that there. But yeah, nowadays you'd have been you'd have been worth an awful lot of money. We had a lad, Paul Midley. Now what would that man be worth now? He could play in any position. The only position he didn't play was in goal. And he he could play anywhere. Anywhere. So he would be worth a fortune. But it's all hype and it's all hypothetical and everything else. It's the most important thing to me is that I came to Leeds at 15 and I've had an absolutely wonderful time. Wouldn't swap it. As I got older, I could not have got any slower. But the thing is that I couldn't get, it was the injuries. I never had an injury, basically, till I was about 32. And then from then on in, till I was 37, I kept getting probably one injury a season, then two injuries a season. And then it became harder and harder to get back into full fitness, to be on the field. Because, you know, at the back where I played, you can use your experience. There would be the odd time where some young whippersnapper would come up to you and knock a past you and fly away from you. But it was the injuries that did me, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't uh, recover as well as I used to do. And my car, I used to start getting calf injuries. And, well, it was something I never had. So that was the reason I packed in. And then I was player manager at Barnsley. So then I went from player manager to just manager. Well, we had the sports shop. Uh, it was just something that I thought, you know, naturally into sport and I could keep the contact with the clubs and, and things like that. But it never really worked. It, we were, I was never good at it. The best thing that's ever happened to me has been my good lady because she's got more of a business head on her than I have. And over the years, we bought one or two bits of properties and things like that. So so we've got that behind us. And, it, and I've got to be honest, it's nothing to do with me. because I don't mind working at it. Even now, like after I've left this interview, we've got a house in town and I'm going to go down there and I'm going to mess about and do the garden and things like that. So uh, business-wise, I, I was not any good at it. I played football and that's all I ever knew, really. Don Rivy was a player when I arrived and then he became player manager, one of the youngest ever, and then... He, he took over and then we just uh, just avoided relegation. Next year we finished fifth, then we got promotion. So then it was just an ongoing thing. And I could not wait. Every day I used to wake up and I used to love to go down there, see the lads and go training. Go training. I miss that more than anything to this day. I don't miss the playing, but I miss... The dressing room, I miss being fit. The dressing room and the banter and the crack was absolutely brilliant, you know. People used to say to me, what did you laugh about? But you can't tell them. It was so spontaneous, it just happened in the whole place. And he made it so enjoyable, Don Revy. It was, it was brilliant. We very rarely trained. All we ever did was, we were that busy playing games that we just played five sides. But, uh, you know, you used to go in on a Monday. We might have a, well, he used to take us away if it was a European game. And then we'd have a couple of days at home. Then Friday, no matter where we were, we were away from home, even at home. You know, took us to Craiglands. You'd have Saturday, Sunday at home. Monday, we were off in Europe. So it all became a little bit too much at times where you were playing a semi-final and you'd just had a quarter-final or something else. And it was just like another game where it shouldn't be. It should be something that is you're really up for. But that's what I remember, whether the lads think it's the same or not. Football intelligence, I think, is, is totally different to academic intelligence. Um, you know, so I, I don't think you can, you can link the two. Um, but um, you know, I just think it—it's uh, it, difficult to say that the academic side gave me any kind of advantage. 
but uh, you know, I think it um, it probably it gave me a, a, a little look into um, into what other people who I studied with were, were going on to do, um, and it probably made me realise I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go into uh, into football and to um, you know try and make a career in that rather than running going to one of the jobs that my, my friends were uh, were moving into. <laughs>